First of all, let me just thank uh, Bill Dorsey uh, and uh, you know his leadership of taking this organization from where it is to you know his comments on on this title of the agenda, the 12 billion dollar corporate ticket marketplace, and a lot of that has to do with Bill. So I, I want to appreciate you and acknowledge you right now at the beginning of this, and and your and your staff. But before I start, I, I want you to know that you know Bill has been known in the industry as somebody who keeps information close to the vest. This this takes it to a new level. Uh, we've got the Corporate Ticketing Impact Conference book, and I thought that there'd be a whole lot of really good stuff in here that we could share. Have you opened it up? Have you seen what, what's in here? There's, there's nothing, but I guess, I guess that means that at the end of the day, this is going to be filled up, and it'll be filled up with some really, really interesting information as well. So from my perspective, let me just tell you that it's been a very interesting few years. Uh, when I started in the leather helmet days years ago, the only people who could qualify as sports agents were those who convinced athletes to say that you were their agent. And there was no such thing as sports business, sports law, sports marketing, sports endorsements, or anything like that, other than the fact that there was a loosely configured group of athletes who had normal legal and business issues and principles applied for them or to them. Just take a look at some numbers very quickly to put all of this in perspective. The total revenues from the big five and the big four in deference to our friends, the Francis at NASCAR, is over $27.5 billion last year. That's all five leagues combined. Total value of net worth from the Forbeses of the world of all of the teams in the four major sports, over $79 billion. And after the Clipper sale, it might be over $81 billion, or it might be 30 depends on what Donald Sterling ultimately does, right? Athletes, when you take a look at the numbers, Tiger Woods uh, at one point, Point was nearly a billion in net worth, and now he and his ex share that billion. The Power 100 that we do every year with the 100 most important or worthy athletes on and off the field, about $3 billion in endorsements alone. You take a look at media, for example. Uh, NBC just gave away their entire net earnings for the last 4 million years for the Olympics through 2032. $8 billion when you look at what NBC has done for all of those Olympics, by the way, it's 62% of the annual gross domestic product of Switzerland, which is a number that Mark Lazarus finds kind of interesting. The NFL and the TV cycle is now $6 billion a year, as we know. The NCAA deal with Turner and TNT, you understand what that number is. So media is bigger than ever. Facilities, which Dan points out, was my kind of original luck into bailiwick since 1990. 260 sports, arts, and recreation facilities at over 27 billion dollars and as importantly, Danny will appreciate this because he increased a big, a big number on a pro rata basis. The private investment on that is well over seven billion dollars and that impacts premium seating and everything else we have here. The events according to the International Licensing and Merchandise Association, over six and a half billion dollars and twelve billion in corporate sponsorship naming and signage and the like. The owners, which is another dimension we should talk about, since 1995, the average value of teams in all four major sports has gone up on an annual compounded rate of about 7%, which is okay relative to stocks and bonds, but it's a lot when you start at about $400 million, then you compound it. And so from a sponsor perspective, internationally, $350 billion in booked sponsorship and event business over the last 10 years. And then the final dimension would be vertically integrated entities. We're all talking about the IMG sales, CAA is involved in this. Lagardere has emerged from a $9 billion international company to a $9 billion international company with a significant foothold in the United States with 1,200 employees and 600 events and 450 athletes in 30 countries. And that's what you need today to take advantage of these spaces. So then finally, what am I leading to? Well, this is, as Bill says at the beginning, of his presentation and the ability to put all of you in a room, it really is all about the fans. Television, 
domestic, international, premium, concierge, regular fans, season tickets, one-shot tickets. It's all about the fans. A lot of dimensions. When you realize that in the next three months, you'll have nearly eight and a half billion viewers tuning into the World Cup, and video streams are now approaching 800 million per month, pretty soon you're talking about significant dollars and significant uh, impact. And so we've grown from a sleepy little business to a business that is not a number one or three two on the Fortune 100 or 500, but a pretty significant business, a $750 billion business and growing every year. And so at the core of it is the fan experience, and that impacts everybody in this room. Just take a look at what happened in the last week. Yesterday, for example, the NBA decided to set its hearing on Donald Sterling on June 3. Why is that important? There are four charges that are specifically allowed and implicated in the NBA Constitution, and they'll talk about them and then do their vote and hopefully force a sale from a lot of perspectives and see where that goes. But charge number two is negatively impacting the fan experience, which is kind of an interesting dimension on how that's going to play out as far as the long-term Donald Sterling issue is concerned. Uh, uh, yesterday, there was a small little transaction, DirecTV and AT&T, only $48.5 billion. So now we see the shakeup in the vertically integrated mobile media, for example. Dan stole a little thunder, but not a whole lot. Johnny Manziel, obviously the enlightened media takes advantage of that, but the 3,000 jersey, 3,000 season ticket increase, the number one on NFL.com, the significant social media which now approached a million and a half unique viewers over the past couple of weeks, largely because of entities trying to take advantage of that space. I hope the guy gets the memo that he's able to throw in cold weather. We're going to have to see how that all works out. But bottom line is, these are issues regarding the fan experience on a regular basis. NASCAR last week announces that as part of its 10-year deals with NBC and Fox, they're considering, they haven't done it yet, but they're considering the possibility of Monday Night Racing. Why? Fan experience as well. And seeing that viewer habits have now been steered over the last 30 years to Monday night, so this is another analog. Television can't be underestimated as it relates to the fans. For a city shopping a 20% stake in the nets down the street, and so their value of the entire entity is a billion dollars, largely because of their perception of international television rights. The Bucks, the Milwaukee Bucks, who haven't won a game in four decades, sold for $550 million, largely because of the international scope of the business. And just over on the other side of the country, the Sacramento Kings became the first team to crowdsource as part of their draft strategy. They're holding a draft 3.0 challenge meant to find qualified statisticians to join the front office and share their experience in identifying players. Now, personally, if I'm a GM, I'm not sure I'm too excited about having 27,000 contemporaries questioning my every move. But if I'm Vinik Ranadive, who owns the Kings and is an Indi Indian entrepreneur non paral why not take advantage of the social media? So another example of integrating fans in the overall offering. The Atlanta Braves, we rework their configuration of their TV deal from Peachtree TV, Turner Broadcasting to their Sports South and put another $500 million in the Braves' pocket. We all understand that one of the key blessings and curses about Major League Baseball right now is the bonanza that comes in from TV direct directly related to the fan experience that also has as the devil side of it the creation of a gulf between the haves and the have-nots. Not saying that if you have money you win and if you don't have money you lose, but I personally would rather have a lot of money than not have a lot of money and I'm sure there are a lot of general managers who feel the same way and so it's a lot easier for the New York Yankees to make major mistakes and recover if they've got $85 million from their local TV dollars coming in that no one else can touch. And of course then the next issue from the television side, all related to projection of the fans, is how far should you allocate the dollars from a Dodgers television network and some of the larger
your mega regionals going back to the other teams versus how much is truly local. Lawyers are having a field day on that and they will continue to have a field day on that. And it's not just the pros. As far as the colleges are concerned, the Big 12 revenue increased $60 billion to 217 million during the last year. We know that Texas, A&M, and Missouri left to go to the SEC, so all of the payouts from those teams jumped in the rest of the remaining teams, jumped about $7 million to $21 million. And when you look at college sports, all of the conundrum there is how much content do we give away for our local Longhorn-type network and still allow the conferences to be happy with what they've got? And if I'm the SEC and I'm looking at a Crimson Tide sports network, I'm not sure that my viewers are going to pay the subscription watching Alabama play UT Chattanooga every week. Although Alabama may be a bad example because they'll watch anything. But the bottom line is this is a good case of television as it relates to the dimension of the fan experience. New England Patriots developing an in-stadium mobile app for fans, which will debut at Gillette Stadium in the next two seasons. The app includes being able to order and pay for food from a seat and watch exclusive on-demand replays. That's not novel because everybody's doing it. The fact that the old line brain trust is now adopting it, what it means is that it is a lemming mentality and you better move forward with it. I guess it doesn't really matter to you that we can all come up with examples of how media and mobile and television and all impacts the fan experience. But there are three things that I want to generalize from as we all go forward, I think everybody having in common in this room, about what some of the next steps are in the entire industry that impact the whole nature of ticketing and fan and the like. Number one, I didn't realize it was a word, maybe I'm behind now, but the number one word is decouching. Uh, everybody, I assume, understands that that's a, a natural, when Dorsey and I were talking about it last night, I guess he uses it in words with friends enough where people pick it up as a, as a common parlance. But we all understand that on my television stuff and the interviews that we normally do, the one big issue that is universally, universally on the minds of every single owner in every single sport and every single event operator, now that labor peace is done for at least seven to ten years, is the conundrum between the couch and the seat. And the dimension is this. I don't know if you all have seen it, but 47 of the leases in the big four sports will expire or at least have an option to renegotiate in the next seven to nine years, which means that every owner either has some newfangled technology that he wants to do to maximize the fan experience or wants to get more public money to cover the new improvements to expand or convert or figure out how to change the dimensions of the premium seats and suites and boxes to reflect the current iteration of the market 10 to 12 years after the original stadium was designed. Every architect in the world, not a knock on architects, claims that they have the flexible answer to a facility over a 30-year period. In truth, there's no such thing. And so you can design 120 suites in 2006, but in 2014, maybe when a lease is over in three years, you have to design something that looks like party suites, and maybe you turn some of that real estate into a television studio or some of it in a common internet area. Who knows what it is? But the bottom line is that this is the time where every single owner is dealing with the kind of stuff that Danny and the people here are dealing with as you're doing this massive renovation, what do you do in it? And how do you do something in it that's going to impact not only this year, but I guarantee you, you ask any of the people who are involved in this, it's going to be beautiful, but you don't want to go through this every year. You want to go through it once every 20, 30 years, or at least until the bonds become due for the next one. And so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we all understand that the most obvious and simple way to deal with the stability of franchises, teams, leagues, and everything else from it from a banker's perspective is the television revenue and the guaranteed rights fees over time. Luckily, we have more and more people watching more and more sports as the ultimate reality TV, and we all understand that for a number of reasons, and the more shows means more appetite, and more people are going to like to watch it, and we're going to prove that over the next few months with a lot of different kinds 
content. But the bottom line is that it is ultimate reality TV, but you can't be too careful about making sure everybody goes to your stadium because you're not going to have people watching. That's not the worry. The worry is that the stadium experience is secondary to all of the mobile apps and everything that's going on, and every program director and every bright mind that ever existed that was directly or indirectly related to DirecTV or AT&T are either renewing their consulting contracts or beating down the door in Dallas today to try to get into those strategy meetings to try to figure out how to make this new merger beat the Comcast NBC merger and make it the second large monolith to try to beat the next guy. What does it mean? It means that there will always be the decouching conundrum. Now, Roger Goodell and Gary Bettman, when we put them on the, on the television stand, will always say, it's easy. Have first-class experiences in both. Yeah, but the devil is in the details. You can't just say, let's figure out how to do both very well, and, and you're going to go to both. So it becomes a very, very important issue. And this kind of organization really does lead the way, because it's not an architect's issue. It's not a construction manager's issue. It's not a technology summit issue. It's not a concessionaire issue. It's not a developer issue. It's everybody. And it's everybody dealing primarily, as I've said, with the fan experience. That's the most important issue here, because the fan defined here is the guy or gal that's going to watch the game on mobile, watch the game on TV, listen to it on radio, or go to the stadium. And if he goes to the stadium, he's going to buy one ticket, he's going to buy standing room, he's going to buy suites, he's going to buy it on a permanent basis. He might even be a, or she might even be a corporate CEO that decides to name it. So the first issue is dealing with decouching on a very, very sophisticated, creative, high-minded manner. Second, the five-star concierge standard continues to be the most important standard as far as I'm concerned because you can identify product and I'm sure conversations out there during the day will have entrepreneurs speaking about how to enhance the premium fan experience with um, I don't know if that means time. Premium fan experience, it doesn't. Premium fan experience with camps, with um, specialized uh, destination vacations, with premium points. I mean, the whole experience is something that is now evolving for the entrepreneurs to grasp it and run with it. And the best entrepreneurs are the ones that can look people in the eye and say, you're wrong and here's the way we can do it. On the other hand, this is something that should apply to everybody. COI was the primary reason why premium seating was done originally, if you remember, and it was the same as television. The bankers loved Joe Robbie's claim in Miami that he would sell out all of the seats and get the stadium done at Sun Life, and you know, at the end of a very long, vicious cycle, uh, our friend Steve Ross decides almost to put up a white flag, and I mean it with respect, because he's doing it for the, all the right reasons, and trying to get a Super Bowl, and saying, all right, we're going to spend the next $300 million putting more private money in it. So that stadium will be the smallest market with the most private money probably in the history of American stadium construction on a pro rata basis. The point is that whole COI getting fans to pay was one of the reasons why that was done. And obviously the PSL campaign with Jerry Richardson and Carolina historically. It's now morphed into, as Bill points out, a $12 million billion business as it relates to every thing that should be generated as a best practices relative to the fan experience. Vendors, entrepreneurs, service providers will all come in, teams will like something, lemmings will adopt it, and then it'll become the standard. That's the way the industry evolves. I would hope and think and charge this organization to be one of the flag bearers and standards to allow that to continue to happen. The final generalization I guess I have is decouching concierge standards and blended amenities. Now what I mean by that is that there's still a 25% 
pro rata share of premium seating relative to the house, and maybe it's going to be a little more. Still, three out of every four people that go into that house are looking at sitting in a pedestrian seat, unless there's a way to define it as a wonderful experience anyway. The last thing in the world you want to create, I think, is an opportunity for someone to take his or her family because they can afford to come to a game and then look up there and see the caviar and the lobster and see bad parking, bad access, and you can't be able to do something else. On a relative basis, the improvements that are made in a stadium for the premium seats will allow you to scale the house higher for them than it is for that other 72%, let's say. On the other hand, from an awareness perspective, from a brand perspective, you, the industry, better make sure that the amenities are blended. And by that, I mean a number of different things. So, for example, ticketing. You know, when I was just starting in the business, um, just like there'd be no gambling sponsorships, let's see how long that lasted, and just like there'd be no uh, jersey logo, logos on, on Team Jerseys, let's see how long that lasted. How about the idea of standing right outside on Roosevelt Avenue with a couple tickets in your hand and waiting for the police and shoving it back in the pocket and saying this is illegal. Scalping. What is scalping? Scalping is illegal. You land in jail. Now, more than half of the MLB teams have teamed up with the experience, the app that allows you to upgrade or buy. My Tickets Mobile allows fans to retrieve their tickets on a mobile device. 20 clubs have enabled through Passbook app to have certain applications installed. Apple's iBeacon technology and on and on. The point is, not only only is this legal, but it is front and center, and teams will go from either seeing this as an opportunity to double dip and maximize revenue twice, probably not the right way to look at it, but teams look at it that way, or an opportunity to provide, again, the amenities for the fan experience. And so, what does that mean as technology intersects with the fan? Crowdsourcing, we talked about that in Sacramento. What about reselling? That's obvious everywhere. Vertical integration, concession the food service folks, your Levy guys who understand and are pioneers of getting information, but then integrating that information across a wide variety of marketing disciplines so your season ticket guys, your regular guys, all the team people can not just increase the awareness, obvious, but also maximize the fan experience, which is also obvious, and make it more convenient. It is clear that if you have your tickets delivered on your computer or at your door or at a portal, it's very convenient for the fan, but it also increases sale and it increases getting money in the bank quickly and all the kinds of things from the business perspective. This is a case where television and fans will come together in the future. And so, final, 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 all of these issues are really important. The coupling or the combination of decouching, the concierge standard, and the blurred amenities. So in the future, the charge is be really flexible. You're going to see high tech and vertical integration of things that no one ever knew before. The best lawyers in the world wrote contracts 10 years ago that have clauses in them that are totally outdated because they couldn't anticipate the evolving technological experience. Not a knock on lawyers. It's just the more flexible you can be in your papering, in your facility design, in all of the things that happen, the better it is not only for you, but also for the fans. Second, the need to be creative. If somebody tells me, and I manage a whole, you know, two and a half people, so I'm not uh, Robert Moses of management, but I, but I have been around enough to see how people react. If someone tells me it can't be done under a current structure, I need to find someone else to answer that question a little better. Because today, the whole idea of who the bosses are and what the service providers are are and where they're going with the next step, it's all evolving. It's all changing. As I said years ago, if you'd have thought DirecTV will be one of the biggest bidders with AT&T for the next round of television negotiations in all of television, what is DirecTV? It's a satellite provider. Well, you know, look look up. And how about Google? And how about AOL? Look today. That's exactly what you're going to see. So second is be creative. And finally, 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 uh, unless you haven't heard it from me a hundred times already, be respectful. Respectful of the fan experience. The people who write off blithely the 
notion that the fan is important because television carries the day and premium seats carry the day are the people that years from now will realize we should have done all of this and covered everybody and cast an incredibly um, expansive net or we're not going to be able to do the kinds of things we think we're going to do. Everybody kind of in conclusion always asks the old guy, how much is enough? Haven't we reached enough? Well, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have six-figure salaries when this guy Messersmith does his thing. And, and how about Kurt Flood? Boy, when that free agency, when that reserve clause gets litigated, we're really going to have player salaries up. And, and how about the deal? The NFL's merger television numbers were $47 million for the entire league for the entire year in 1970. Well, that's a lot of money. Well, you know, last year it was $5.5 billion. It's going to be $8 billion once DirecTV gets in the next race. And so the answer is there is no ceiling. It's a nice thing to talk about. People in the media talk about it all the time. That's enough. $200 million naming deal? Are you kidding? AT&T at Cowboy Stadium? That's enough of that. Well, the answer is it is not enough of that. And the advantage of vertical integration, creativity, respect for the fans and being flexible is the sky is the limit for this industry, for the people in the room, and as important as anything else for the fans. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. It's an interesting thing because my, you know, I'm now spending most of my time with media. I've got a TV show in Bloomberg and other things, and I had sold most of my core business a couple of few years ago. But the biggest challenge I think right now are is the tension between the older guard, and I don't want to stereotype it by age, but let's say it that way, the older guard who is resistant to the change that inevitably has to happen, all of the dimensions I've just talked about for the last half hour, and the newer guard who is slowly assuming positions of authority. I, this is heresy, but I'm going to say it anyway. Most of the owners in the, in the leagues today, except for a few notorious exceptions, uh, are very entrepreneurial. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made their billions of dollars to afford to squander some of it on cash or players or, or be in the business. The next level are, are really entrepreneurial people because a lot of the owners brought their people over from their respective businesses, so that's fine. The really generalization, the 20, 30, 40-year-olds today who have the degrees and think and vertically integrate and see the trends, in the next 15, 20 years, no problem. Everybody is going to, every team's going to be run with the creative thinkers who think vertical integration, revenue maximization. And well, I believe me, I'm not getting specific, but there is a core of leadership right under that first level who have been there for 30 years and done things for 30 years. It's the old money ball scout, which is, that's another bad example, but it's on the business side as well. And the real difficulty is to make sure that best practices are viewed by the right decision makers in those organizations that can have an impact on the leagues and the industry, again, for the sake of the fans. It's, it's, not, it's not your father's business anymore. So. so given everything that you just spoke about, which sport is best position for the next 10 years? And you got to do polling, and you got to do fan appreciation. How's that? Is that good, Land? You like that? Okay. Um, boy, that's an interesting one. The NFL is on such automatic pilot. I predict in the next five years we will have 20 rounds of the draft, and we will have them spread out over a 20-evening period, and we will have it rotated in NFL-worthy cities, not Detroit and L.A., but Keokuk and Des Moines and and some of those places. Obviously, in jest, but look. At what the NFL does and has done. So when you look at the respective sports, NFL, seven to ten years of remaining labor peace. Roger has challenged the staff to do $25 billion a year. They're all, oh my God, but they're going to try to do it. International expansion is an opportunity, not a curse. The LA situation is dynamic, but you don't have to go there to keep the deal done with the league. And the whole issue, the one the one issue, two issues that, that will be important to them are the anti trust issues relative to television carriage and access, and obviously the concussion and medical issues. So I still think 
they're way above everybody else. Uh, the, NF the NBA globally, the NBA will be king globally no matter what. Their stability is there, their labor piece, their biggest thorn to me or, or Achilles heel is the have and the have not revenues. Memphis, Oklahoma City, San Antonio, they're not lucky. They're enlightened managers, but the guys, friends like Clay Bennett in Oklahoma City said the biggest issue for us is we are a small revenue town. We perform like a big revenue team, so nobody takes this issue seriously now. Well, they will eventually. And so that and baseball the same way. I predict, by the way, that Bud Selig will stay as commissioner until he was 138, which makes leadership issue uh, easy there. Uh, baseball's biggest issue is the leveling of the playing field, I think, there, because all of these teams with this extra, extra 70 or $80 million of, of revenue that they get locally can plow dollars back in, and there's no structure to share like there was in the NFL that started in 1963. Hockey's great. You know, Gary Bettman laments that he's not very popular north of the border, and people in Montreal and Toronto don't like him because uh, they stole franchises. Last time I looked, we had a team in Atlanta that's moved back up north, and, and Gary just did a $5 billion deal with Rogers TV. So even the NHL looks good. So I guess what I'm saying is there is a three-way tie with football number one. Where do you think that soccer MLS is going to go in relation to all the other leagues? Well, on a pro rata basis, the values have increased more than any other league ever. And a lot of it is because Don Garber keeps putting a $100 million number on every deal that's been done, real or not. Uh, but he is an incredible promoter, and the New York deal is really positive. The Atlanta deal is positive. The Orlando deal is positive. David Beckham can't just will a stadium in Miami, but assuming that gets done, that's an important issue. So the MLS is looking at the expansion like the big boys, the new television deal. And I think this is a good example of synergy, by the way. I won't keep talking long, but, you know, NBC and the Premier League deal that they did has done more to elevate the awareness of soccer as a sport in the U.S., I think, than anything else did. So if I'm Don Garber in the MLS, I am really excited about the NBC deal with the Premier League because it raised the, the tide for everybody. And so as that continues, I think soccer becomes, uh, everybody says a fifth major sport. You know, when I was growing up four million years ago, and we had Pele and Beckenbauer and all those guys, and, the, and, and we had the Rowdies and the, and, the, and the Whitecaps, and oh, this is it, because those kids, when they grow up, that's it. Well, then in 94 in Rothenburg, well, this is it, because uh, it's a different dimension now, and I think it's the World Cup is going to help, assuming that, uh, that falling bricks at stadiums isn't going to impact people, and at the end of the day, it's going to be one of those things where it's a perfect storm, and will continue to be a perfect storm. So, a couple more, and then we, it's it's not fair to my panelists, right? So, yeah, it is because I keep talking. No, it's not fair to the panelists. Uh, one more, sir. Uh, Rick, you talked about Cleveland and Johnny Manziel, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what if we plop the player? Do you want to play him? Do they have to start him? Wow. There's an interesting dimension. You know, you talk about his 3,000 tickets and his number one in jersey sales. Uh, what if he didn't get the memo that you're supposed to play well in cold weather? Uh, you know, what about uh, playing well? What about the memo that he's not Fran Tarkenton? Uh, that's a risk that a lot of teams looked at. And when you develop a brand, you are subject to the blessing of Michael Jordan or the curse of Ryan Leaf. And frankly, today, as, as Dan would, would say, based on the introduction, it's a lot more difficult today. Why? Because social media, branding, it's, it's, there, it's not easier. It's more subtle. It's more sophisticated. But there are light years more opportunities than there were even 10 years ago to develop somebody's brand and somebody's persona. If he, he's got two issues. He's got to behave like a normal human being that is still preserves that magic but also makes him look like he's not so arrogant that people aren't going to like him, especially in Cleveland. And frankly, Cleveland is used to villains that are created in Cleveland and going somewhere else. Uh, we have one in Miami named LeBron James, so let's see how that all works. Bottom line is performance trumps all, and we'll see how that goes. So, so thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, boss, do we want a three-minute coffee break, or do we go right into the panel? Where are you? Go straight? Okay. You're not the boss. That's the boss. Yeah, you are. You're the boss today. All right. Guys, thanks.